Tonight, China, the Olympics, and doping. Congress set to ask the greatest of all time, Michael Phelps, what needs to be done to ensure Chinese athletes are not cheating. In moments here on the Hill, we are speaking with the top lawmaker looking into the World Anti-Doping Agency. Donald Trump's gag order somewhat gone. What the judge just ruled, what Trump still can and cannot say. Also this evening, she's back. But why now? Hillary Clinton with a new book and a new op-ed in the home stretch of a presidential race. Plus, they're the newest chance. How two stars envision this very moment while riding on the school bus. And is one governor taking the air out of some fun or making the right move? Why some kids will no longer release balloons into the air in the Sunshine State. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. And welcome to Washington Tonight. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. A live look right now at the White House as a couple big headlines originated out of this town over the last 24 hours or so. Let me explain how it likely didn't just all of a sudden randomly come about here. Here's a headline in Axios. Scoop. 16 Nobel economists see a Trump inflation bomb. It reports how the esteemed economists are, quote unquote, jumping into the presidential campaign with a stark warning. Former President Trump's plans would reignite inflation. Also today, the nation's top doctor, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, declared that gun violence is a public health crisis. Our failure to address it is a moral crisis. To protect the health and well-being of Americans, especially our children, we must now act with the clarity, courage, and urgency that this moment demands. Now, we are, of course, just two days from the consequential first presidential debate. So what you are likely seeing here is the campaign and the administration taking full advantage, full advantage of the power of the presidency. And you could argue rightfully so. And as for Donald Trump, his advisors are seemingly trying to raise the expectations for President Biden. There was a call this afternoon with reporters in which the Trump team said, quote, we know that Joe Biden, after taking an entire week off, he's going to be ready for this. Now, I don't know if it's going to quite be at the level of Steve Rogers walking in and coming out as Captain America, but his team is ready, is going to have him ready. Joining the panel tonight here on The Hill is Julia Manchester, national political reporter for The Hill. Scott Bolden, D.C., former D.C. Democratic Party chairman, News Nation contributor as well. Aaron Perini is a Republican strategist, and Kelly Meyer, News Nation Washington correspondent. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in on this Tuesday as we sit here, what is it, 50 hours or so uh, yeah. until the debate, what yeah. we're all looking forward to. Right. You got these stories, Kelly, and yeah. it's not random that they are popping up. This is the power of the presidency, and yeah. the Biden team is trying to arm this president with as much as, as possible for Thursday night, are they not? Exactly. It's the, the debate prep before the debate happens. We're still two days away. We've seen Biden at Camp David getting prepared, doing his mock debates. But as you said, there's all these stories coming out of things that he can use on the stage and saying, my administration did this. This is what I'm tackling. Coming out there with policy uh, work because uh, their campaign doesn't think that Trump will come out there with as much policy discussion. Right. Uh, but then, as you said, the Trump campaign on the call today, lowering uh, where they had lowered the bar for Biden. Yeah. Now they're kind of raising it again, saying essentially he's ready. He's done all these debates in the past. Uh, he's going to be more prepared than also calling out the media for saying that we haven't done enough to call out Biden for taking a week off. But it was interesting them changing their strategy. <laughs> so both teams, as you mentioned, kind of having this strategy game going into uh, this night. We watched the power of the presidency right now on full display? I think you are. And look, I mean, what you're seeing, you know, Joe Biden is at Camp David this week. He's not really out front and center. However, his campaign is very much doing a number of yep. events ahead of the debate. So they are very much trying to push this narrative that he is being studious. He is going to use the podium of the presidency. He's go It's going to be like a State of the Union night. Um, and it's interesting to see how yep. Trump's messaging has changed on this and sort of uh, maybe ri raising those expectations for Biden. So I went back and looked. What, what was the big stor story leading into the last presidential debate, which would have been October 20-something of 2020? Trump had COVID. Uh, that was one of them. Yes. <laughs> and show this. 
Hunter Biden story is Russian disinformation, dozens of former intelligence officials say. What is that relevant to any of this, Scott? Because that is when the Biden campaign at the time put out the 50 intelligence officials Mm -hmm. saying, you know what, that Hunter Biden story, that's Russia, 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 Russia. We know it wasn't. And my point here is that's what you're seeing today Mm -hmm. with the 16, um, you know, esteemed economists saying the economy... You're, we're in big trouble if Donald Trump is the next president. Yeah, I like those 16 economists. I mean, that <laughs> sounds good, actually. But um, this is called debate shaping. Debate it's not shaping. De- de- not de- debate prep, because they're shaping the narrative and adding pressure to the Trump campaign with these positive stories. And you're going to continue to see them drop up until Thursday and then beyond that, probably, because it's just good politics. The other thing is interesting, that if the Trump campaign has changed their uh, style or changed that they're raising the level for Biden. What's interesting is they haven't done anything for Trump in the sense that he's not prepping, he's having conversations, he's having rallies, and he's just going to be shooting from the hip. Did they get this wrong, Republicans, by trying to lower the bar for Biden? I think lowering the bar for President Biden was a bad move by Republicans, and I think it's been that way the entire time, whether it was the State of the Union or any other thing. The man has been in politics for 50-some-odd years, has done a few debates, has given a few sets of remarks before in his life. We (laughs) need to understand that the man is the President of the United States. He will be a formidable opponent on that stage. But I will say this. They're showing their playbook now. They showed it in the the Biden campaign. They showed it in the State of the Union what they were going to be campaigning on coming up into the general election season. Now with these stories... It's clear they're going to be talking about guns in the United States. It's clear they're going to be trying to spin the economy. Last week, the Joint Economic Committee put out a report saying that, yep. no, wages are, didn't, aren't you know, are growing faster than inflation. Yeah. Don't worry, folks. The problem with the Biden campaign, even if they put all of these proactive stories out, is they're trying to get the American people to believe, don't believe your lying eyes. Well, it doesn't are, feel as bad as it really is for you. It's not as bad as you think it is. Why aren't the Trump folks going doing the same thing? as it relates to policy, because they're just attacking the moderator and, you know, it's... it's the Trump campaign's putting out a multi-front yeah. uh, position right now. They are, one, getting on the phone with reporters and working them and doing the work that every good campaign should do, which is, I'm going to set our narrative now. Biden's team's playing a bit more in the press with these things. But also, the Trump campaign is already laying the groundwork to say, we've got issues with the moderators, we've got issues with the format. And Trump himself said, we accepted this because we didn't want people saying we wouldn't accept it. Well, that's expected from Donald Trump and his team. But the the reality is not only is Biden prepping, Biden's got to get ready, right? He's got to be a great counterpuncher because he knows that the bullying is going to come even if they cut the mic, right? When 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 Trump attacks him with some wild statistic or just kind of haymakers that make no sense or have no empirical data to support him, Biden's got to be able to counterpunch, right, with stories, not statistics. he got to go toe-to-toe with him, wait for Donald Trump to punch, not get upset, and counterpunch you back. You look like you've if done that before. That, You're in there tight. Right. you got those jobs If he tight. does that, then it's going to be a good night for him. I'll give you the last word here. (laughs) Well, look, I think it was interesting watching the Sunday shows this past weekend. I mean, we see, you know, the Biden campaign doing their press strategy, but we also see the Trump surrogates, as Aaron was saying, out in the press, you know, hiring those expectations for President uh, President Biden, I should say. But look, I will say this. A lot of Republicans I've spoken to have said that in 2020, during that first debate, that is the beginning of Donald Trump's loss of the Mm. presidential election because he came in way too hot, was erratic, and it, it just it, it put the debate off. The, the audience side. thing might be uh, something that may make Trump more of a measured. more serious, more measured. Oh, yeah, so yeah. that yeah. it could help him, or it could be something unexpected. Or make him but here's the Sorry. thing: but Democrats are saying right now they see this as the kickstart for the campaign season. This is where things jump off. Wasn't that the, De- wasn't that the State of the Union? Well, though? right. But isn't this isn't this deck? This is Democrats are trying to gin up their base now because they have okay. Democrat voter malaise. And that's what Biden's biggest issue is going into. All right. Well, meantime, in just an hour back here in Washington, up on Capitol Hill, the House Energy and Commerce Committee will hold a hearing on anti-doping measures ahead of the Summer Olympics in Paris, just about a month away. Now, the most decorated Olympian swimmer of all time, the gold medalist Michael Phelps, his uh, fellow uh, swimmer, the 10-time medalist Allison Schmidt, will be testifying up on the Hill. Now, the hearing comes after the World Anti-Doping Agency allowed 11 Chinese swimmers to compete at the Paris Olympics, despite testing positive for banned performance-enhancing drugs during the Games in 2021. The Republican congressman from the state of Virginia, Morgan Griffith, is the head of the subcommittee holding that hearing, and Congressman Griffith joins us live. Thank you, sir, for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate it. I wonder, 
Um, look, I mean, a- any time that, that you get Michael Phelps, the GOAT, right, uh, up on Capitol Hill for a hearing, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs, a lot of attention. I, and, and, and I guess that's probably part of the play here, right, to get some attention on this, because I wonder what, what Congress can actually do about this. Well, what we can do is, of course, bring attention to the issue and hope that the world will reform itself. But we tried that seven years ago, and Phelps is a little upset that nothing has happened since then, and I don't blame him. We put about $4 million into the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency, uh, and we should expect them to create fairness. We're not asking for any advantage, just create fairness and make sure that the various countries are following the rules. China has not done that in the past, and we expect that we're going to see problems this year as well. And it calls into question uh, some of the medals that they've got in the past. And will it call into question the medals that they might win this year as well? I hope it won't. But they've got to clean up their act in China. And the World Anti-Doping Agency has to clean up their act as well. Here's some of the numbers. Uh, 23 swimmers from China tested uh, positive but were not suspended. 11 of those 23 are going to the games here in the upcoming weeks. They tested positive for the performance-enhancing drug known as TMZ, which deals with the heart. You know, the the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency, Congressman, I believe we give them about three million bucks a year. Should we take that money away? That's yeah, taxpayer funds. Yeah, 3.8 is almost four. Okay, should we take the money away? We could take that money away. Well, we could take that money away. What I would rather see us do is work on a plan with other nations to create a completely independent agency because what you'll hear in the testimony tonight is is that the World Anti-Doping Agency has people who represent various countries' uh, Olympic committees on their team so that when China had their problem in, before the 2021 uh, Olympics, one of their lead people was actually on the board at, uh, at the World Anti-Doping Agency. Right. Is that why they didn't report it to the rest of the uh, world? Maybe, maybe not. But if you have a completely independent agency, the testimony tonight will indicate maybe we get a better shot at getting a real anti-doping agency policing all of the athletes, not just those of, of the nations that are more open what? to having testing done. What about Russia? Because they, they can't, they can't uh, the athletes there, you know, there's a massive doping scandal with, with Russia. How do we know that the, that the athletes there are clean? Yeah, I'm not sure that we do. Uh, Obviously, they had some Hmm. sanctions in the past. Russia is another uh, actor who in the past has shown uh, willingness to use uh, performance-enhancing drugs. But right now, it primarily is China. But that doesn't mean there aren't other nations because we rely on the nations doing self-reporting to the world agency. And then the world agency doesn't take action. You know, i I got to imagine, Congressman, there's some folks watching us here on News Nation, screaming at their television or listening to us on Sirius XM, screaming at their radio, just saying, pull the funds. Get that $3.8 million out of there. Why not just do that? Well, the the only problem that I would see with that is then we have no agency. I'd rather have something in place beforehand because if you just pull our funds out, then we have no agency doing anything on anti-doping and you just create a free-for-all. All right. Congressman Morgan Griffith. From the state of Virginia, head of that subcommittee, who is going to be in front of Mr. Phelps and Ms. Schmidt here uh, up on the Hill in just a little bit, uh, in about 45 minutes or so. Congressman, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate it. Glad to be with you. You got it. All right. Still to come here on the Hill on News Nation over the next 45 minutes or so. The gag order, not quite gone, but close. What Donald Trump now can and cannot say and what his team wants next. Jesse Weber is joining us. Plus, taking the air out of some fun, is that what's going on? Or does the governor have a point? Why balloons are now a new target in the state of Florida. And clean up on aisle 46. President Biden's team said the Sunshine State is not going to be theirs. But then they pulled a 180. Trump has his sights set, too, on some states that has some saying, keep dreaming. So what's really in play? The man with the number, Scott Trainer, will be here with us on The Hill. You are watching us, The Hill on News Nation. Stay with us. The Hill on News Nation. So House Republicans seemingly giving up the fight against Jack Smith, the special counsel trying to lock up Donald Trump. While some in the GOP have called for his office to be defunded, Republican appropriators today chose not to mention him in a proposed budget. They did, though, propose to cut $1.3 billion from the Justice and Commerce Departments. The top appropriator called that, quote, fiscal sanity. 
as a reminder, the national debt right now stands at $34.8 trillion. Now, the White House responded to this by claiming, quote, Republican officials attempted to defund law enforcement to the benefits of violent criminals. All of this is both sides are pointing the finger at judges that whatever point it it benefits them. Look at this post from Monica Lewinsky, who says the judge overseeing the classified documents case, Eileen Cannon, should be impeached. Here's what is, there's a lot of absurdities to this. (laughs) I don't know which one you want to take first, but let me start here. Um, $34.8 trillion deficit. We're going to cut $1 billion. That is that is like the the crumbs on the bottom of the bag of the potato chips <laughs> and saying we're getting rid of the crumbs. Right, right. And, and calling that fiscal sanity. Sanity. Yeah, look, I mean, this is, uh, we're talking about this in terms of, uh, I'm sorry. The, the national debt. So the national debt's debt, at yeah. $35 trillion and they're like, oh, look, we saved a billion dollars here and there. This is fiscal sanity. That's that's crazy. Right. No, no, it's absolutely crazy. It's definitely scraping the the bottom of the barrel, um, you know, going for it. Look, it's just, it's, it's hard to explain. Really? Right. Yes. So what about this from the White House then? They come back and say, um, you're defunding law enforcement. I mean, that's a, a scare tactic, is it not, from the White House? It's, it certainly sounds like it. Absolutely. A scare tactic, um, you know, and it bleeds into the presidential race in, the way, in a way because right. this is, you know, Trump's legal issues. So this is, exactly yeah. what the, this is exactly what the White House is doing, though, right? Saying these are cuts to law enforcement because with crime still being very prevalent in a lot of communities and in cities, uh, the defund the police movement hurt Democrats, especially in the 20 cycle. And it's something that continues to haunt them. This is the White House's attempt to play cute with the language and call it law enforcement, right? The Department of Justice that, so that they feel that they have a talking point here against this. What? However, the one, the, the billion dollars cut, the ability for Republicans to put forward budgets that make cuts and try to do any balancing whatsoever when it comes to the budget, that's a good thing. And even if it's not that big, but it's, it's a step it's in the right direction. It's fiscal insanity to describe oh, a billion dollars as fiscal have, sanity. It's, right? it's fiscal insanity that, for the most part, Democrats call it a cut if you don't increase the budget at all. Because we've seen that time and again, I'm working on the Hill, where if there are not even increases but you maintain funding, they call that cuts because a lot of the time there's already built in pre pre amounts of things will go up. So for Democrats, like, everybody's got a bad side on this. This isn't great, but at least Republicans are doing what they said they would do and try to get fiscal I house. Well, why do Democrats have a bad side on this? The Republicans because cut they one, were one, one billion dollars. And DOJ... Talk to, talk to her. And <laughs> DOJ, <laughs> sure, I'm sorry. No, DOJ, DOJ does have all federal law enforcement officers under it, and it cut one billion dollars. The Republicans are defunding the police because that one billion was going to fighting crime and going to support Applying for law enforcement me. officers. I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's messaging and what have you. But don't say the Republicans aren't trying to defund the police because it's right there in black I and mean, white. You and I both know that that's intellectually dishonest, that nobody is going to have the back more of law enforcement than so Republicans then, in this country. Where does the one point billion go then? Well, I haven't seen they the full line by line, but I, I bet you either. there's more than they a cut, billion dollars well, in cut, waste that I can be cut from any federal agency in this country. Federal police officers are going to be cut because of the Republican You haven't seen that, so you can't make that claim if you haven't read it line by line. because the DOJ. But that's not the to say there's a direct officers, cut to police they reduced, officers. So what they, did, going, what they did, it's a bottom line proposition what they did was reduce the DOJ by $988 million. Let me ask you this, because, Scott, I've heard you talk on this set nonstop about how Republicans are attacking law enforcement and attacking mm-hmm. judges, and that's got to stop. Yeah. I see Democrats left and right going after Eileen Cannon. You good with that? No, they're not, I don't think they're going after Eileen Cannon. Oh, yeah, I think her judiciary, former judges and, and other independents, and the Democrats can, can, can be critical of her, but how she's handling the case. They haven't called for her removal, per se. There are others who have, but not the Democratic you know, elected officials. So That's is it okay to be case. critical of Marshawn as to how he was handling the case? You can be critical of any judge in regard to how they handle the case. They can take the fire, and that's part of the politics of prosecuting Donald Trump. But in, in Florida... Cannon's criticism is coming from not only from how she's handling the case, how she's holding hearings unnecessarily, and how she's dragging it out that supports Trump's delay tactics. That's where she's getting her criticism from. Well, that's the line there, supports Trump's delay tactics, right? Because because that's, I think that's part of the part of the point here is now all of a sudden you got Democrats saying, wait, 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 wait. We don't like how this judge is handling that thing. You have law professors who have no political affiliation criticizing how she's handling this case, how she's dragging it out. I've been in, law, I've been in the law game about 32 yep, years. Longer than I have. Tried cases all over this country. I'm telling you that hearings are good. 
but they're not always necessary, and that drags this process out. You okay. don't have to have hearing on every legal issue because it's been filed. Stand by for a second, because also sure. today a judge today modified the gag order put on Donald Trump in the hush money case. Trump can now comment on trial witnesses such as his former fixer, Michael Cohen, and the jurors. Judge, uh, Judge Marchand says Trump still cannot speak about lawyers and staff of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the court if those statements interfere with the case. The gag order never applied to Judge Marchand or the DA Alvin Bragg. The sentencing, as we know, set for July 11th. Kelly, I wonder um, what we're going to hear out of Donald Trump and his team now that they got like a, a partial win, I guess, but could be viewed as a, a loss too for them. Yeah, and then if he goes in and brings any of this up, does it leave room for him to bring it up in the debate or does that, you know, mention right. these names in the debate now freely? Um, they'll probably continue to say that he should be able to do it completely or mention names as much as he wants um, and, and continue to fight this. But um, I think it, it, I mean, maybe they'll see this as a partial win in a sense for, for them going forward. But I do think it may be something that he could bring up on Thursday. Real quick, or the judge is baiting him. Or, or what? Baiting Trump mm. to, to speak against these witnesses, speak against these jurors. Remember, mm. he's going to be sentenced later in uh, July. Yeah, like and as a result, the judge can take any and everything into consideration in sentencing Donald Trump. So mm. if I was Donald Trump, I wouldn't take the bait. I really wouldn't because it's not really relevant, probative, or material to his debate or really his political future in the sense that the case has been tried. They've rendered a verdict. The witnesses aren't there. But what if he wins on appeal and he comes back and Alvin Bragg tries him again, hmm. and he's criticized the witnesses and he's criticized the jurors. It can have a very negative impact on him going forward. You've got to be careful. He brings this, this up at every rally, though, so I don't know. Yeah. He might bring it up on <laughs> Thursday night. I, I, don't, I think it's going to be hard for him to not yeah. bring it up. I never take my legal yeah. advice, but yeah. that's my legal <laughs> advice. Oh, yeah. So much more ahead here on the Hill. On the other side of the break, hot mic with Mick Mulvaney. The former Trump White House chief of staff, congressman, budget director, tells us what he's hearing, what he's Thinking, I think you missed uh, Seersucker Day by a couple days, but I appreciate you rocking it for us, Mulvaney. You ready to talk uh, Hillary Clinton? I think we're going to talk some Hillary on the other side of the break. You know, you always ask me this, so I actually studied. We're going to do Hillary, we're going to do the Fed, we're going to do the primaries, but then it occurred to me the name of the segment is Hot Mike with Mick, so I may just make something up uh, uh, entirely different. <laughs> <laughs> Mulvaney, other side of the break, you're watching The Hill. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation and Hot Mike with Mick. Hello, Mick, the former congressman, budget director, White House chief of staff, tells us what he's hearing, what he's thinking. All right, Mulvaney, Hillary Clinton. Yes, her. She is back just two days before the presidential debate. Uh, there was an op-ed today from Clinton in the New York Times entitled, I've debated Trump and Biden. Here's what to watch for. She is actually the only person, I guess, who can ever say that. She also has a book coming out. Just a, a few weeks or so before the November election. You can see it there. What's going on here with Hillary Clinton? Mick, to your best guess. Yeah, look, it was a great title. It is. And you're right. She's the only person to debate the yeah. two of them. So the headline of the New York Times piece is really interesting. And I figured, OK, I'll mm -hmm. read it. Um, I wish I had that four minutes of my life back after I read it, because you can summarize <laughs> it by saying this. Donald Trump is the devil and Joe Biden needs to do better. Oh, that's fine. Okay, that, that's not really th that insightful. Uh, and then you realize she's writing her, her memoirs. That also caught my attention because I figured, wow, I mean, this is one of the most accomplished women, you know, in, in American history. Hasn't no she doubt. written a memoir already? This is fascinating to me. Yeah, she's written like six of them. So I'm not really sure what's happened in the last couple time, uh, months since she wrote her last one. Mother Teresa, by the way, wrote one. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure that... That asking Hillary Clinton how to beat Donald Trump in a debate or a campaign moves anybody. Face it, she's the only person ever to have lost to him in a campaign. Hmm. Um, and I'm not sure her writing a piece in the New York Times is going to make one bit of difference one way or the other in the outcome of this race. It might help her sell some books. Look, I, I okay. met her at Columbia University. She was very gracious yeah. to me. I enjoyed our interaction. She hosted a, 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 d a discussion with me and Jeff Zients about the role of the chief of staff. I have nothing but the highest respect for her, but I'm not sure she's a player anymore when it comes to the 24, 2024 election. 
What's she doing here? You know, I thought it was actually interesting, the memoir, because it's true. She is the only person who has debated yeah. Donald Trump and Joe Biden. The difference there is what, uh, when she debated Joe Biden, he wasn't one of the major players on that stage. It was the Clinton versus Obama <laughs> match. But I, I think it's interesting. She very much has this experience of debating Donald Trump going head to head. And, you know, there's it's questionable whether Democrats really want her advice right. at this point. But she does have a unique perspective perspective on this. All right, Mick, uh, some more news potentially about the prospects of an interest rate cut. Uh, David Rubenstein, head of the Carlisle Group, telling CNBC he believes the Fed will hold off on cutting rates until after the election. Watch. Generally, the Fed wants to stay out of politics. And so I've always said that I think the Fed is not likely to cut rates before the election because it would just cause too much political turmoil. Mick, I think he is spot on. I do not think the Fed is going to jump in here unless something earth shattering happens. You, OK, I see you, yeah. you disagree. Well, I, I think you're right. But for, the, for a different reason, that's one of the things that okay. I think Wall Street doesn't understand about Washington, D.C., writ large. OK, the Fed is political. Cutting rates right now. David is absolutely right. Cutting rates right now would be perceived as something political. I have news for David Rubenstein. Not cutting rates will be perceived as political. It just depends on what huh. side of the mm -hmm. aisle you're on. The Federal Reserve is a political body, whether they like it or not. The question is, do they respond to one party or the other, or they try and play it right down the middle? But when, I, when we were doing the research for this, what came back to my mind was that piece that Brendan Boyle and a Democrat senator, I forget who it was, it might have been Sherrod Brown, wrote to the Fed last uh, month White and House, said, please Sheldon cut White rates. House, I believe. Was it Sheldon Whitehouse? Yeah, saying yeah. please cut rates. I mean, if that doesn't invite politics into the Federal Reserve, I don't know what does. So, look, the Fed is politicized. It just is, uh, and that's not okay. going to change. I don't think they're going to cut rates, but I don't think they're going to cut rates for economic reasons, not for political mm. reasons. They're not satisfied yet. They have inflation under control. All right. Uh, meantime, you served in the House of Representatives for a few terms. I wonder what you think of what we're uh, seeing today. Uh, which is a primary day, election day. Some of the members of Congress running for re-election in tonight's primaries. First off, the New York Democratic Congressman Jamal Bowman. We are going to show an impact the power of the mother South Bronx. We're going to show them who the we are. Okay, so sitting member of Congress, and then on the other side of the aisle, Nick, is the Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. She had the incident in a musical, in, in a theater, in a, in a production, um, and I, I want you to take a look at the ad that her opponent <laughs> cut, and I'll get yeah. your reaction on the other side. <laughs> I'm John Padura. I'm sitting in the very same seat that Lauren Boebert got kicked out of, the same way she got kicked out of Colorado's third congressional district. <laughs> oh, boy, that's going in. Uh, this is the body you served in, Mick. I wonder what you think about these two trying to get their jobs it's back a today. It's a fabulous ad, and I won't defend Boebert, and I won't ask Scott Bolden to defend Bowman. Here's the fascinating thing about the primaries. <laughs> they... They open the I door won't. into all of the, the family dirty laundry, all the family fighting, all the infighting, all the, the NNIC sort of squabbles. They, they sort of let the world look into that. You're seeing the Bowman versus Latimer race in New York. You're seeing to, uh, uh, the Boba race is, 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 is its own thing. But you had the yep. Good versus McGuire race in Virginia. It's party on party violence. The real question is this. Hmm is which party can come together better after the primaries are over. Typically, Democrats do better at that. I'm not sure if they'll be able to do that with Palestine being the central issue, but it will be fascinating to watch. But look, what you just saw is evidence of, of, of where our politics is on both sides of the aisle. Um, and there's a, you know, it's sad that we talk about the Bowmans of the world and the Boberts of the world, and you don't talk about the folks who are actually in Washington to try to make law and improve the country, but that's 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 the way Washington yeah. works these days. We, we we normally don't. I mean, you're on this sh this show a lot, Mick. As you know, we normally we don't talk about those folks for for those kind of yeah. reasons. But today and, exactly and yesterday right. with Bowman, we we are because they, they are on the ballot, and it, it's a time to look at at sort of what they've done and you know and and what voters have before them. I found it interesting, Mick, and, and hang with us here for a second, as you basically said that this was a a time. Or what's interesting is how the parties then rally around. Mm -hmm. Both Julia and Aaron were nodding along yes to that point, mm -hmm. that that is essentially what must 
come next, or at least what you think needs to happen next. Absolutely. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but Democrats have a major base issue right now. And this is absolutely going to be a problem for Joe Biden. If you, I mean, right now, this is a contentious House primary for the Democrats in New York. New York is part of the pathway for the House majority. So if Democrats can't unite in New York, yes, I think Biden's fine in New York. I don't think New York's actually on the map for Trump as a, as a possibility. But it, will have, a but it will have, <laughs> but it will have, but it will have implications down ballot. And it will have implications up ballot for Biden in terms of where the support is in his hardcore base. Right. You know, I look to a state like Michigan, obviously, that seems to be the prime example. But if we're going to talk about these states that other candidates are you know, targeting that might be outside of their universe, I am curious about Virginia because Donald Trump is Donald Trump's holding his post debate rally in Virginia. Uh, Joe Biden is in North Carolina, but Virginia, is, you know, Republican governor. But I would say it's a blue leaning state. Mm -hmm. But is. you have Republicans aiming, uh, you know, spending money there, opening offices, holding post debate rallies with mm -hmm. Glenn Youngkin there. If Joe Biden has a base problem in Virginia, yeah. like he has across the country, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Virginia is really unique in the sense that Northern Virginia outvotes Southern Virginia every yeah, like every two different. Two different well, it's like not for Glenn Youngkin. Exactly. Not for well, Glenn, Glenn Youngkin, Youngkin they was will, a very unique, yeah. but they uh, will. But Republicans sure. are really trying to run up run up the the score there. I, I mean, if was running for if Duncan was running for president, I'd agree with yeah. you. Trump so, is and Youngkin is nothing like Mick, Donald Mick, Trump. Mick, let me let me end end with you in this um, as as they talk about Virginia. Because I know there's a race there that you're watching, Bob Good, who is a member of the House Freedom Caucus, which you started a decade or so ago, and uh, he's contesting it there, and I'm not sure it's the best look. Yeah, one of the most fascinating races, if you want to sort of see inside Washington, D.C., go read about this particular race and read what people are saying about this race. And who's saying it? I mean, Warren Davidson, one of the most reasonable people you are ever going to, to, to meet, a member of the Freedom Caucus, was attacking Bob Good and actually put out a letter in favor of McGuire, the challenger, by saying, let's drain the swamp, get rid of Bob Good. Ryan Zinke, a former cabinet secretary, is on, uh, in the press today calling Bob Good a sore loser over the fact he's not going to concede the race. This is a big deal inside the conservative wing of the Republican Party, and it'll be fascinating to see, again, what was the theme? Will they be able to come back together again after this is over, or will this type of fight tear them apart permanently? I have no idea yet, but we'll see. Hot mic with Mick. You're back in studio tomorrow, right? I'm live, so. and I might bring the same seersucker jacket tomorrow just to, uh, just to impress you. Rock it. I love <laughs> it, my man. Thank you, sir. We'll catch you tomorrow. See you guys. Mick Mulvaney. Thank you. All right. This Thursday, by the way, we have a special night of coverage here on News Nation as it is debate night with Chris Cuomo starting at 8. Chris sets the stage for the uh, big matchup. Then, of course, at, at 9 o'clock is the debate, and you can catch our simulcast here on News Nation. Our coverage then continues here on News Nation right after the debate. But before then, and coming up here on the Hill, on the other side of the break, I saw a story. Uh, it was last night into today where the Biden team said they're not going to win Florida. So then why did they come back and say, you know what, For forget all that. Forget what we just said. Plus, does Donald Trump have the same pipe dream in and around the Big Apple? The man with the numbers, Scott Traner, joins us when The Hill on News Nation returns. Thursday, starting at 8, it's Debate Night with Chris Cuomo. At 9, it's the CNN Presidential Debate Simulcast on News Nation. Then stay tuned as Abrams, Vargas, Vittert, and the best political team anywhere break it all down. Begins at 8, 7 Central, Thursday on News Nation. This headline from Julia, Biden re-election campaign chair, Jen O'Malley Dillon, now ruling out Florida as a battleground state. But her comments came as the battleground states uh, or the campaign's battleground states director, Dan Cannon, and followed that up with saying, quote, Florida is in play for President Biden and Democrats up and down the ballot. Joining us now is the data science director from Decision Desk HQ, Scott Traner. Scott, hello, hello. Hang there for a second because I want to ask Miss Manchester over here. Uh, that was cleanup on aisle 46, was it not? Yeah, no, it, it, abso absolutely. Um, look, this was interesting because ever since we saw that abortion ballot measure, uh, you know, news earlier this year, Democrats started paying a lot more attention to Florida right. as an opening more offices, uh, running ads in the state, hiring more staff. There's also a Senate race that's right. happening in Florida. Rick Scott's up for re-election and former rep uh, Debbie McCarcel Powell is challenging him. So, you know, the way I look at it, and I think a lot of Democrats would say this too and Republicans as well, you have your core battleground right. states. 
Then you have the states on the outside. Virginia, one of them. I would say Virginia is closer to being a battleground than Florida. Florida is certainly looking in. Right. I think right now, Democrats, the Democratic Party infrastructure in Florida is still rebuilding itself. They had a lot of issues for a while. So here's why I wanted to raise this, Scott, because this was a, this was a great example. It is not in play. Yes, it is in play from the top of the campaign within a matter of hours. And why I wanted to do this story and share it with the audience is because we are going to hear from both sides of the campaign. This state is in play for us. And it's really not. And we've looked at some of the numbers. For example, Florida, Donald Trump, the DDHQ forecast has him up, has him as an 80% chance of winning in that state. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, I understand the PR and the campaigns that used to be on one. You've got it. You've got to claim that you're on the offensive everywhere. But the DDHQ Hill model looks at everything, not just the polls. It looks at the financial strength, the historical trends, um, demographics of the state. And Florida is a Republican state. And you look at it down ballot. They have control of both state houses. They have um, basically control of all the statewide offices. It, it, it is a Republican state through and through. I know the Democrats want to make it a, uh, a battleground state, but all the numbers point otherwise. All right, so, oh, no. Well, I've said this a million times on this show, but just because there's left-wing ballot measures, in Florida in particular, does not mean that the people voting to enact those ballot measures, you know, more on the liberal side, are going to vote for a Democrat. We have seen that split before, and, you know, I think it could happen again. All right, Scott, so let's go to the other side, right? Because I hear from Donald Trump, New York's in play, New Jersey's in play, Minnesota's in play. Your model, 93% chance in New Jersey for Biden, 66% chance for Biden in Minnesota. Um, and I don't think there's much of a chance for the former president in New York. Yeah, look, New York is is the Democrats' version of Florida. They're going to win New York. I understand there's some polls. I understand there's some rallies, all that. But look, the model says, and the model's based off all of these different data points, and it amalgamates them all and, and synthesizes it. There is a better chance of a Joe Biden winning Florida than Donald Trump winning New York. But both of them, New York is going to very likely be Joe Biden and, and uh, Florida is very likely going to be Donald Trump. And that's just the demographics and the trends of the states right there, no matter what the polls say. So just remember, when you hear this state is in play, remember this segment over the next four months or so <laughs> and what happened over, uh, I don't know, an hour or so uh, just yesterday. Scott Traner, thank you, sir. I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right. Meantime, did you see this? The Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, signed a bill yesterday banning the inter- intentional rather, release of balloons in an effort to cut back on litter and reduce harm to local wildlife that can mistake them for food. Now, children under six are exempt, as well as weather research and hot air balloons. Florida joins nine other states in limiting or banning balloon releases. You used to work for the governor on the uh, presidential side mm-hmm. of things. What's he doing here? I think this is actually a very smart move given Florida and the economy and the demographics in the state. One, I understand the governor was a little hesitant to sign this because the last thing you want to do is get kids in trouble for releasing the Right, kids. yeah. That's not what this does. This is a very agriculture, horticultural heavy state. There's a large equine community in the state. There's a large cattle, all sorts of animal communities out there. With that said, when these balloons pop and they don't stay up in the air forever, right. When they do pop and come down, they they end up in fields, and horses can easily get tangled up in them. Cattle can. They can eat them. They can mistake them for food. So that alone in and of itself, yes, the pollution part, they end up on beaches. They can end up everywhere. But just based on the economy of the state, this absolutely makes sense. Ron DeSantis keeps himself in the news. Well, it's also interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. ahead. It's interesting because Ron DeSantis, he's an, I I think to a lot of people, he's an unlikely ally to the environmental cause. He's actually very much (laughs) into conservation. And he's done a lot. In Florida, you have to be in the Everglades. Everglades. So this is an example of that. He also got sort of crushed in that state for some recent climate change stuff that he's done. But I mean, you know, we're not going to stop talking about this guy Mm -hmm. for a little while. Yeah, and it's keeping him in the news, like you said. Um, Maybe some kids with their birthday parties might not be too happy about it. So maybe Democrats will say he's ruining birthday parties. I don't know. Um, but he is, yeah, I think it, it does keep him in the headlines. Um, he's going to keep doing things in Florida. Maybe, you know, well, you may know. but um, <laughs> <laughs> She does know, I promise Potentially you. 2028. Yeah. Keeps him in the news until then. Well, like, if I'm 10 years old and I let the balloons go at a birthday party, right? You get caught, $150 is, is fine. Who's going to pay the fine, the 10-year-old or their parents? I mean, it seems kind of complicated. I don't know. 
I mean, I, my, I should talk to you about this. You, 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 you and I can have well, this What happens to the 10-year-old at the birthday party? I'm not sure on, on the specifics of it. Listen, it, mm-hmm. this is reasonable right. expectations on balloon setting go okay. and, not, and letting go and not that we're going to be locking up 10-year-olds over balloons. By the way, as we start scum, summer, schools are out, and there are kids all over this country running around, hanging out side by side. Could they be the next Matthew Kachuk or the next Jason Tatum? Would you look at this picture? Uh, on the left there, Kachuk. On the right, Tatum. Buddies. Riding the bus as kids. <laughs> Growing up in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, if they don't ring a bell, if those names don't ring a bell, that kid on the left just won the Stanley Cup last night as one of the stars for the Florida Panthers. The kid on the right led the Boston Celtics last week to an NBA title. Matthew Kachuk saying this after the win. Two champs from St. Louis. Are you kidding me? All the teachers and classmates, you all should be very proud. Two champs, baby. So when you think about all those kids running around this summer, playing ball out in the backyard or doing whatever they do, could they be the next buddies riding the bus that are at the Stanley Cup and NBA champs? Who knows? Just something for you to think about. Other side of the break, Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, joins us. Gavin Newsom, what is he doing in California? Did you hear what he recently said? Leland joins us. Back to the Hill. So before we say goodbye, here's a story that caught our eye. The California governor, Gavin Newsom, declaring his state or delivering rather his state of the state address and came out attacking the right in what you could say is a bit of an unorthodox speech. Our values and our way of life are the antidote to the poisonous populism of the right. And they want to roll back the same time social progress, social justice, racial justice, economic justice, clean air, clean water, and basic fundamental fairness. They would cleave America from the principles of freedom and the rule of law. Joining me now, host of On Balance, Leland Vitter. Is that a state of the state address or the 2028 address? I don't, I don't well, know. You can what... go check it out on YouTube because he didn't give it <laughs> to the state give, legislature. He didn't give it live, yeah. Which, which, interestingly enough, right, if only we could do away with the State of the Union address and it could just and be just on YouTube. It on and YouTube. We, <laughs> YouTube. We, could, we could all enjoy a Tuesday night. Save ourselves, night a, late, yeah, and, save and, ourselves yeah. a late night of work, right? So Gavin Newsom may be onto something. 